I'm speaking here with Alex South uh, about his new exhibition, Gathered Leaves, which is a retrospective of his work over the past 15, 20 years? 15, uh, something like that. Which includes four different bodies of work. We're at the uh, media space uh, here in London at the Science Museum, and just gonna talk a few over a few things with Alec about his work in general and his, his thoughts about photography. So I'll try to keep the questions uh, somewhat constrained. There'll be a bit of humor, maybe not. I yeah, don't know, it depends hey, on your mood. That's good. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to kind of talk, first off, uh, looking at the exhibition, the way it's laid out, um, it's quite clear that the publication that Mac has done that goes with the exhibition, which will be traveling, um, is, is greatly informed by the book. Mm -hmm. uh, your books seem to be um, ultimately where the work kind of colludes into a solid form as opposed to maybe um, you know, different photographers looking at, can't wait to have my exhibition. You mm. seem to be very centered with Little Brown Mushroom as well on publications. Um, has, has, did you start that way with uh, being interested in the book format or is it just? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, one of, one of the ideas of this show, and if I can you know, just minorly correct you because I'm trying not to use the word retrospective, because, uh, you know, I'm much too young. <laughs> well, I'll just take the much next question young. right out of there. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. I mean, it's uh, because it, I, I understand the use of that term, but I, uh, it feels pretentious and I feel too young. Yeah. Uh, and, and so in creating this exhibition, the idea was to give it a focus. Um, and what could I focus on? Uh, I actually... A few things came to mind. One was that this place is called Media Space, and I thought, well, wouldn't it be interesting to explore the actual, you know, medium of photography and the way, uh, you know, I process it in different forms in, in the book and the exhibition. Um, I did come from the book side of things, for sure. Um, and what's interesting in the exhibition, because it starts with Sleeping by the Mississippi, and, and the prints are small, and and the book is highlighted, um, and then it changes. There's an evolution over time in which I, I learned and had a better sense of how to hang a show, and so, like, the Broken Manual is much more an exhibition event. Um, and, yeah, and, uh, but still, the book is, you know, kind of the ultimate container because uh, shows come and go, but, you know, the book lives on. Um, just thinking, uh, maybe we could take advantage of talking about different different series within yeah, the work. I, I certainly have um, questions. I might even go backwards here. Yes. Um, and uh, Songbook for me is, uh, I, I, I've got all of your books, but uh -huh. I, I, I was quite surprised with Songbook. I mean, first of all, black and white. And there's a sort of anachronism with, with the look of the work. It's such a... a, a I don't know if, if, if uh, awkward or queer or so, surreal queer in the sense of, of, mm -hmm. of uh, sort of awkward not engendered. Um, were you using like a Graflex 4 or 5 for this? No, I mean, how I did mean, you get this sort I'm, of I'm, news? Yeah. <laughs> I'm mimicking the look of a Graflex in, in many ways. Um, and, you know, early sort of press photography, Ouija, et cetera. Absolutely. Um, but in fact, the working process, uh, uh, particularly in my collaboration with Brad Zeller and the, and the creation of these newspapers that we made, uh, there's incredible fast turnaround time. So I was working digitally, um, but just working with a big, you know, a big flash. Um, and there were different reasons. Uh, one is that I was I wanted to function like a journalist and. Um, and that means being able to photograph in any scenario, really. So it's like, you know, you're photographing the mayor, the mayor's backlit, so you can just overpower the light with your flash. Um, and, and black and white also leads to that flexibility. And then, of course, I, the work is referencing another time. Um, a lot of it has to do with this kind of, you know, nostalgia, longing for the past, Anxiety about the future, etc. Do you think that's a condition of our our, our present uh, American 
uh, you know, I wouldn't say uh, I wouldn't say imperial on on, on, on <laughs> decline, but uh -huh. I mean there is this, you know, these these spaces, uh, you know, in the photographs where things are somewhat uneasy for me, um, which is why I'm drawn to it. It sort of speaks about what's in the cracks mm -hmm. that are forming, you know, infrastructure-wise or just in a, in a societal discourse. I mean, does this? Um, and knowing Brad and knowing his interest in, in 50s and, mm -hmm. and, and writers like Jim Thompson, I think, is yeah, one of his guys. Yeah. Um, there is this kind of longing uh, to, to kind of have back maybe that post-war 50s like sense of like when everything was a wonder, you know? Sure. Do, do you feel it's a sort uh, of informed that way? I, I, th I think I was contending with that longing um, in, in multiple ways. I mean, first of all, the newspaper itself as this form of social communication that once existed um, and and I th but I think we have a you know a deeply romanticized version of the past I mean the fact is I can photograph the world around me and it looks like the past and you realize the past didn't look this way it, it wasn't flash lit it wasn't black and white and there you know there were you know child molesters and you know wife beaters and you know and the whole thing and it's uh so this longing that we have i think is ongoing yes we have lost certain things and and there's a sense of some kind of loss of loss of community but at the same time community still exists it's not like it's over um and this work it it's dark but for me it has a lot of comedy too and it's um and there's a joyousness and you know, thinking about, you know, Graflex and I think Ouija is a truly joyous photographer. Absolutely. And he's just sort of like, takes pleasure in the insanity of life. And um, there was an element to that for, for me. I've loved making this work. It's, um, it, it sort of resonates with me that there's this um, imbued sort of sense of false nostalgia that, that mm -hmm. enters into it, which I, um, you know, in hearing your thoughts on it, I can see was uh, sort of capitalized on a, an informed aesthetic, which you've probably grabbed from just looking at photography, looking at all these sort of old um, yeah. 50s newspapers, things like that. You know? Yeah, and I'm interested too in, you know, f you know, one of the films I'm really interested in is The Last Picture Show. And, and so, you know, like a black and white film, you know, made in the 70s, but it's about the 50s, but it's dealing with more contemporary themes, but there's, there's a tension because you see something that's more contemporary in this context and feels off. Um, and and I, I think that also speaks to, you know, how this work is different, You're talking about black and white. And, and my ambition has been to function more like a filmmaker as I go on, um, where each project, you know, has its own world, its own voice. Hopefully there's a thread connecting all of the projects, but that that thread is not technical. It's not, you know, and, and you know, Martin Scorsese, you don't connect his films by the fact that he, you know, uses the same camera. Um, and, and he can shoot, you know, black and white for Raging Bull. That would be another example. Um, and then make a documentary about the Rolling Stones. And then, you know, but hopefully, and I'm no Scorsese, but it's you know, but but hopefully uh, these things can be connected. And one one of the things I'm feeling really good about with this show is that I feel like, oh yeah, this is all me. Like I know, you know, it really does. Like it feels all me. It's familiar in the way, in the way that it flows, and it feels like it's uh, you know definitely part of your evolution, I suppose. Yeah, evolution, and I but I see, and I just I'm so aware of how. The, one project is connected to another, and uh, yeah, it feels good. Would you work in film, uh, more in film? I think you have a... Well, I've, I've, I, you know, I've done little experiments, um, which have never been you know, wildly successful, to be honest. Um, so, I, I, I think I'm letting go of that fantasy for the most part. It's just like, it's too much money, too many people. Yeah. Um, and I love it, um, but you know, this is yeah, this is my language. This is what this is what you do. Yeah. It's not a necessary trajectory to have to have this next stop 
moving moving image. No, I mean, never say never. You, you know, who knows what'll happen, but um, yeah. But as of now, I'm really I I've fallen in love with photography again. Um, I fell out of love with it a number of years ago, and and I just don't. Yeah, I'm not like embittered by it, or um, I'm just kind of happy to keep chugging along. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm going to you know play the chronology of this totally yeah. backwards again and uh, <laughs> talk about Sleeping by the Mississippi. Yeah, of course. Um, which is, I guess, um, you know, sort of being that we were in the same place at the same time, and when that book came out, mm -hmm. you know, it was a hugely watershed moment for. For you, I mm -hmm. mean that—that's the, the the gates open, you know. Right. And, and thinking about, you know, what, what was that? Two thousand two? What year is that? Two thousand three. Yeah. And four is when it really. Right. Yeah. And the Whitney was. Two thousand four. Four. Yeah. So I mean, I mean, since then it's been um, incredibly nonstop for you. I mean, it's just been. Uh, I hate to use the the obvious word, but meteoric in mm -hmm. the, in the sense of how things okay. have happened. Um, does it? Does it ever get to a point where, you know, the, the post Sleeping by the Mississippi work, was there ever a junction of which uh, with Niagara was the next yeah. body of work? I mean, making that transition after such, uh, you know, an opus came out, were there ever any difficulties between making the trans... I mean, they are kind yeah. of similar bodies of work in a, in, in a visual sense. Oh, absolutely. No, they're very similar in a visual sense. And, no, I felt a lot of pressure with, with Niagara. Um, yeah, because I'd had this attempt. It was a classic sophomore scenario, you know, and I, I moved to Gagosian Gallery, this, you know, big gallery, and uh, lots of people paying attention. Um, and I survived it, you know, so it's like, it, and I'm, you know, really proud of the work, um, but it was not an easy time, for sure. Um, and, yeah, once I, once I got through that, you know, that was like one gate. <laughs> and uh, and then I needed to sort of redo everything and reorganize things. And then it was a big process of taking things apart and putting them back together. And that was really broken manual. Yeah, which also has a, um, it's still got this Americana feel. Yeah, um, sure. You know, about the dispossessed or the, the yeah. how to disappear, I think, is the, the yeah. sort of way to look at it, yeah. which is, um, you know, looking at fringe communities or fringe cultures or off-radar, off-grid, yeah. how, however it works. How, how difficult was that to actually become involved with these communities? Was it easy to find them? Was it, you know, what, what was yeah. the... Uh, well, I mean, there's, there's a couple things at play, too. I mean, you know, I mentioned, like, my process of taking things apart. I mean, you know, each project is sort of about you know, stuff in America, but it's just as much about myself <laughs> and my own process. And, uh, and some are more inward looking than others. And Broken Manual was a deeply inward looking project. And for a significant chunk of time, I was not photographing anybody. I was, just, you know, I was actually literally looking for a cave that I could own. Um, and, uh, the actual people that I did meet, you know, they were somewhat challenging to find. I mean, the whole, part of the whole idea is that, they're, that no one truly runs away or we don't know about them if they do. And, uh, and that people, in fact, need other people. And, and so they are, you know, somewhat accessible. You can find them. Um, that the whole thing, the whole notion of disappearing is a fantasy. That's kind of the idea. Uh, so they were they were out there, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of circulate and talk a little bit with you about uh, something that you're passionate about. Uh -huh. Tell us a little bit about Little Brown Mushroom and and, and what what your St. Paul organization <laughs> is, is 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 sort of doing. You're doing these things with Brad. Uh, you still you still keeping on the no yeah. So I mean Little Brown Mushroom. Uh, the I mean the way I like to think of it is this sandbox and it's just this little place that I can go and play around and try stuff out and and in the beginning I started I, I self-published something called the last days of W and it was really fun I was like oh that that was fun I'll do more self-publishing and um, and then slowly I found a voice for it it had to do with the relationship between text and image and um, collaborated with all sorts of different uh, photographers and writers putting these books together. 
Then I ended up collaborating with Brad on several projects, all text image based. Um, and Little Brown Mushroom got bigger and bigger and, you know, we're doing book fairs and, um, you know, distribution systems and all of this. And then it started feeling less like the sandbox. It started mm-hmm. feeling more like another business, which is not the reason that I created it. So I said, you know, Brad and I were finishing up the dispatches. We knew we had to do seven uh, because Brad is, uh, you know, incredibly OCD and has like obsessed with the number seven. Um, when that was done, we were done. Uh, and I, I said, that's it, like hiatus on publishing. Um, and I had this real desire to pursue something in the educational arena. Um, but I, like Little Brown Mushroom, I didn't want it to be about making money. I wanted it to be about just playing, experimenting, and trying stuff out. And so I'm right in the middle of growing this thing called the Winnebago Workshop, which is this mobile classroom for teenagers to work on the possibilities of storytelling, visual storytelling, through photographs or, you know, drawing or writing or what have you, but the visual storytelling. Um, and, you know, I don't know what I'm doing, uh, but, you know, we did a trial run this summer and we're, our Kickstarter campaign is rolling. The idea is that it's free for the teenagers and, um, and I'm, you know, working on bringing in other artists to collaborate with us. Is this in St. Paul then? This is, is this in St. Paul, right. yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, because, uh, um, I mean, I really, I, you know, as much as I love being a photographer, I don't, I don't believe it's, you know, like a force for good. I don't believe I'm, you know, documenting the world for the future or showing the truth in America that's going to change people or whatever. You know, I think it's fine. It's like, it's not, and I don't think I'm doing harm necessarily, but I'm not great good, and I want to do something good. Um, and I think education is a path is one path and an educator and my teacher totally changed my life and um and i work a little bit in education um but i want to just do it on my own terms yeah. and just uh and be you know wilder with it <laughs> i guess that's how you you end up inspiring uh, more i think when you have these sort of key figures in your life you know that uh, photographers uh, teachers that kind of make it exciting. And if yeah. you get bogged down with the bureaucracy of university education, um, I, I would suggest like anything, it becomes its own beast and maybe a little bit less yeah. fun to, to, to deal with in those confines. Yeah, Brad and I, we co-taught a class we, as an experiment. You know, we were offered to do this um, at, a, at a big university. And it was really interesting. Um, but the, you just, the, yeah, the bureaucratic forces, which we weren't, really immersed in but they were swirling around us you just yeah you just get lost in that um so yeah and i don't it's not going to be my whole life i'm going to do it for a while see what happens and uh and and play around and then grow it and it's this other idea that like uh everything has to grow and become bigger and bigger and bigger um and i just i don't i think there's a limit to that and that was the thing with the dispatches as well like they got bigger and more expensive and more partners involved, and it was great. Um, but I just don't want to do that infinitely. Yeah, um, yeah. Churning, churning it out when it starts becoming part of a wheel, maybe it's... it's, it's yeah, I think to... it, that's, that stuff's good for business, but it's not necessarily good for art. Right. Um, I often thought of the musical analogies. I mean, this is songbook, and, uh, and Brad and I really, in the beginning, it was like... You know, we're in the basement, and then we're doing little bars, and then by the end, we, you know, collaborate with the New York Times for the final dispatch. So it's like an arena show, and you know, you just can't do arena shows forever. Yeah, yeah. unless you're Rolling Stones. Yes, yeah. ACDC. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Um, with within that, you know, because um, you you have this kind of um, slippery position uh, between artist 
and also working with Magnum, mm -hmm. who that is not to say they're uh, they've never taken they they work with plenty of artists, but right. this sort of idea of um, when it happened when you signed up with Magnum, I remember everybody being kind of like. Really, you know, uh -huh. is this this new documentary sort of right. uh, feel, or I mean, as as do you have freedom to do? I mean, how, how does I don't, I don't understand how Magnum completely works apart from how Kappa started it and how it didn't work when it started. So how how is it now that you're able to show or work with them and still have this sort of your own aesthetic, which it, it very much is when I see the Magnum. Output. Yeah, I mean, Magnum is you know uh, is profoundly misunderstood, uh, and I totally understand why because it's uh, because it's a complicated organism um, the, I mean my take on Magnum is that you know first of all Magnum is not really an, an it's not an agency it's certainly not a news agency it's uh, it's a cooperative it's a, owned by the photographers it's a thing that's owned by the photographers and and when Magnum was founded it it did have, at the very beginning, you know, Kappa and cartier Brisson, kind of representative of, you know, this, this war photographer and this surrealist, but who's in the world. Um, and in both cases, they're in the world. And I think what connects Magnum photographers, for the most part, is that they're not, you know, they're not making... Uh, you know, digital collage, or they might do it on the side or whatever, but they're actually like engaging with the world. Um, so there's no real difference in, in aesthetics when you, you know, even in the history of Agnum, you know, photographers are making the images that they want to, and you're, you're, you're part of this, whether you're being relegated to the artist side or not, you don't see a yeah, distinction. I mean, in, there are all these people that have always actually existed on different sides of the spectrum within Magnum, um, and there have been different points when it's been more or less controversial. Uh, but there, there is something connecting them. And, but the other thing that, I mean, that Magnum was founded on was protecting photographers' rights. And fundamentally, that's about authorship. And, um, you know, Magnum is not, you don't see uncredited photographs by Magnum photographers. So, they are considered authors. If you imagine a, a, a cooperative of writers, this would be like a cooperative of nonfiction writers, but they could, you know, they could work on all sorts of different levels of the spectrum um, and, and who are authors, yeah. Okay, I've got one kind of final question for you. I'm actually gonna have to read it because when I was writing it, I was like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's very uh, specific okay. to geography. All right. And, uh, Actually, I like an answer. Yeah. I, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, it, was, it was a bit of a. Um, <laughs> you guys aren't going to get this because you've probably never been on Highway 52. Um, <clears throat> have you been to the House of Coats Bar outside the Pine Bend Petrol Refinery, alongside Highway 52, but not far from the disused military silos on the side of Rosemount, Minnesota? I hear the Swanee Burger is spectacular. Have you had a chance? <laughs> It's a very specific, geo-specific geo question, uh, you know, to Rosemont, which I think, in its absurdity, kind of defines a way of looking at, at, at some of this. I certainly have. I mean, first of all, this is so inside. I like, how do we, how do we, I mean, we're sitting here in London <laughs> talking about, about Rosemont, Minnesota. About Rosemont, Minnesota. Uh, you know, one of the bleakest places in America. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Next to Gary, Indiana. <laughs> it's, it really has a quality of Gary, Indiana, yeah. actually. Um, yeah, I mean... Have you been to the House of Coats? Of course I've been to the House of Coats. <laughs> um, you know, so, it, you know, Brad Zeller and I did a project called House of Coats uh, that's titled, yeah, after this restaurant, and they must go berserk, you know, trying to figure out what the hell we were doing. Um, because it's a famous restaurant, yeah. famous for the burgers. I'd I've been there multiple times. It's delicious. Uh, I've thought about leaving copies of the book <laughs> in the restaurant. Uh, and I actually, so, you know, this is more, more of an answer than you're gonna want, but um, Brad and I were collaborating but we're not together at this point. So separately, okay. he was writing something and I was making pictures. I actually rented a room uh, 
near Rosemount, above a bar, the different location, and became my my studio or my you know my retreat for a period of time. And Brad had actually spent time, you know, because he's spent time in different sort of rooming houses over the years uh, in a similar place, and we both go to places like this either physically or spiritually at different points in our lives and this is something that, that deeply connects us so yes i not only have i been to the house of coats you know i i partly live in the house of coats <laughs> a solid patron yes yeah. all right yeah. okay well i think that should uh, that should pretty much conclude uh, everything we've done i hope that was all right oh uh, fantastic yeah yeah you know it's a um, breeze what a, what i don't a know you know you probably get a lot of the same questions but uh, it was a bit awkward wording on that last one but i know oh, no. yeah, i know that you know i had the um, i photographed that petrol refinery from the side of the road when Did i you get arrested u of m i was at the u of m yeah. photographed it on the way back to wisconsin 35 millimeter black and white Guy comes up behind me. I'm not. A, I'm on the side road. He's like, "Give me your camera." No. Give me your film. No. This is a private property. I said, "No, that's private property. This is." He's like, "He's like, I'm. You know, give me your film." And I sped off. He followed me. Took down my license plate and then kind of turned off. Three months later, FBI knocks on my mom's door. Like, what's your kid doing? He's at university doing art school. Why was he photographing the petrol? This is after 9-11, of course. So yeah. everything went mental. No, I mean, so believe it or not, you know, I, I drove by there. This is long before House of Coats. I was with the filmmakers of Somewhere to Disappear. We were headed out to work on more broken manual stuff. And we stopped there. We actually got a flat tire there and all and they were filming and all hell broke loose I mean and I've learned this m multiple times at places like that for, it's more secure than you know yeah anything else and you know like prisons or whatever yeah you, you stop at one of those places it's big trouble they're, they're on you like yeah the like oil industry <laughs> it's like more powerful than you think. You think in Minnesota too. You're thinking like no big deal. You know, it's a kind of a, a spectacle. This thing, you know. But they're I like. I don't even know what. I don't understand it because I don't know what sort of information you can be garnering. Plus, you fly over the thing all the time. You know, yeah. airplanes are always yeah, yeah. flying over it. Yeah. Uh. But for some reason, a telephoto lens from the side of the road, you know, a 21-year-old kid or a film crew is just, you know, fixing a flat tire it's becomes, outrageous. you know. It's outrageous. No, I have been there. 